Okay, back with Dr. Saiful. Uh, we have the bio uh, down in the description. Uh, my endocrinologist from Glen Eagles. Doctor, we touched about what is thyroid and also the diet and also stress and all that. So today uh, we move on to treatment. Now, as you know, I went through the medication treatment, the medication route with doctor for the whole of 2020. Um, but there are obviously other ways you can go about thyroid, right? So can you explain uh, what are the options that a thyroid patient has in terms of medication, surgery, and all that? Okay, so if we're going to deal with uh, overactive thyroid, um, there are three main options. And of course, in, in Malaysia, uh, the, the easiest option is medications, which is what we tried uh, as well as reading. So medications can be sub further subdivided. There are multiple ways of treating with uh, two main medications or multiple regimens. I'll just jump on to the hardest one, which is the second option, which is radioactive ID, and the third option being surgery. So if you want the ultimate answer to have mm -hmm. a cure, in other words, uh, the removal of thyroid overactivity forever is to mm -hmm. remove the thyroid gland. Yeah. However, it's such um, an onerous kind of decision to make because even in the best hospital in the world uh, that does thyroid surgery, and they only do thyroid surgery in Florida, the actual rate of complication is still quite high. So out of 100 patients who go for surgery, you got a 1.5 to 2.5% risk of complication. So that's in the best hospital in the world and you still have that risk. So we rarely, if ever, recommend surgery as first line. The only time we say surgery is an option is mm -hmm. if the thyroid is happening during pregnancy. And oh. there's no other way to control it. In other words, uh -huh. the, the thyroid is so overactive, the medications yeah. is too dangerous because it can cross the placenta. Uh, you can't use radioactive iodine because that can affect the baby. It's surgery. Yes, and I we have had cases where patients undergo that. Um, the second option that I talked about, this thing called radioactive iodine, which always gets people a bit worried because of the word mm -hmm. radioactive. So the, why it's called radioactive is because it's a tablet about that size, white in color. It has been labeled with radiation or radioactivity. Uh, what it does is that radiation, once you swallow it, 99% of it goes into the stomach, gets absorbed in a small bowel, goes all the way to the thyroid and ablates it, puts it to sleep. And 1% mm. is excreted in the urine. But the problem with that radioactive ID and surgery, both of them, you end up being underactive. So for the rest right. of your life, you've got to be prepared to take a tablet. So how good are you at taking a tablet for the rest of your life? And the tablet's mm -hmm. called thyroxine. So the, the treatment that we recommend, what we use generally in the rest of the world, including Malaysia, except for the US, US always goes for radioiodine first, but the rest of the world is tablets first. Because if you go for tablets, um, in the particular regimen that we use, which is like, I would call it the shock and awe treatment, uh, you only need to be treated for a certain period of time. And after that, you know, the thyroid goes into full remission. Mm -hmm. So like, like what we tried with yourself, Serena, we went for this one that's called uh, carbimazole. Right. And we, we, that's a very potent antithyroid drug, as you know. And, mm -hmm. and so we try and suppress the oh, high, really high overactive thyroid down to below normal. And mm -hmm. then once you're below normal, we add in thyroxine to bring you back up to the normal. So th there is a philosophy behind this. Why we do that? Because if I don't block your thyroid enough with the carbimazole, and that's the danger that a lot of us make. We, we start on a big dose and we reduce to certain number of doses, so let's say on 40 milligrams to 35 to 20. That was the old approach, is a wrong approach, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because you're not on the lowest, most effective blocking dose. We want you to be on an effective dose. Right. And the, the, the ideal effective dose is that 40 milligram dose. It, it's sort of um, the de rigueur for most, I would say 99% of patients. Uh, unfortunately, if you leave on it, for too long, let's say about eight, nine weeks, you go under. So I can't leave a patient underactive, as you know. So you add in thyroxine to bring them back, back to the surface. Um, so it's like, it's like a balancing act, what you're doing with you're me. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, is there a timeline where you stop with the medication and go, okay, we need to go for surgery now because the medication is not working normally? How long, how long 
do I need to take the medication before you, you know, decide, okay, it's time for surgery? Yeah, so that, that's a brilliant question. So a lot, a lot of patients have um, little patience when it comes to yeah. treatment regimen because there's a lot of tablets to take. Um, mm-hmm. But then you have to remember for other uh, chronic conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, you'd be taking a lot more tablets for diabetes. We yep. looked at it as well. Most patients of ours are taking, when well, we audited about 6,900 tablets a year for diabetes. Same with cardiac conditions. So with thyroid disease, if you think about, you know, eight tablets a day, um, mm-hmm. after a period of about roughly, uh, we'd say between one year and mm-hmm. two years. So some of my our patients that we treat, uh, the majority are okay at about 12 months to 18 months. Some need up to two years. If we oh. fail at two years to stop it from relapsing, then you're right. The next discussion that we have is either surgery or radioactive ID. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's a discussion together. We, yeah. we don't make the decision unilaterally. Well, then I have two questions because like you said, uh, uh, the surgery comes with a lot of complications, right? So then you have to juggle then, okay, what are the complications, for example, that you, you say, you know, even in the best hospitals in Florida, they have complications. So what are the complications that we should be looking out for? So I, I need to ask you, are you, are you a singer by chance? Uh, do you like to sing? Oh, the voice thing, because it's too close to the voice box, right? Yeah, exactly. So the thyroid gland is right, right. Plonk right there. Right. And there is the nerve called the recurrent mm-hmm. laryngeal nerve that wraps around it and mm-hmm. supplies the voice box. So right. in other words, and it's so delicate. If you by mistake nick it, uh, you're a soprano, uh-huh. it's gone. There's a risk of okay. losing your voice, of, 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 of your livelihood. So mm-hmm. I think it's a decision that's not lightly made. And that's why when we decide to operate on that, we work very closely with the ENT surgeon as well mm-hmm. as the thyroid surgeon to operate together to make sure I, that the recurrent laryngeal nerve is not affected. So they check the voice box before the surgery and the voice box uh-huh. after the surgery. Oh my, that, that's scary for someone in my line of work, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. If, so if what is the percentage voice, of, yeah. 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 But you, what you is get the, the husky, of, Barry White voice. You know? <laughs> oh yeah, that might work as long as I can work. Uh, I mean, talk, you know, husky is good. <laughs> Chipmunk is not good. Okay, but jokes aside, okay, that's one of the complications. What other complications are we looking at when it comes to surgery? Yeah, so the, the thyroid gland is sitting right here. And as you know, the big blood vessels from the heart has to wind itself up to go to the brain mm-hmm. and face as well. So it's very easy to nick some of those blood vessels. So the danger, of course, during the operation is bleeding, number one. Uh- number two, it's a lack of circulation that goes up to the brain. So there's a high risk of stroke or lack of circulation Uh to that part of the brain. Um, Because it's such a vascular organ, it takes Mm -hmm. a lot of time to remove. So Mm -hmm. a lot of the time there is um, an element of um, a long operation. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, there are four little glands at the top of the thyroid, two up here and two down Mm -hmm. there. They're called parathyroid glands. And they're Mm -hmm. responsible for the calcium homeostasis. So in other words, right. how, how level your calcium is in your blood. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this parathyroid gland secretes a hormone called parathyroid hormone. If you got too, non, too little or none, your calcium goes down. And what mm-hmm. happens? Uh, big risk to this organ, to the heart. So your mm-hmm. risk of getting irregular heartbeat and the heart sort of slows down, puts your risk of what we call arrhythmia. Uh, not good. High, mm-hmm. Low calcium can cause sort of uh, numbness around the lips and across the face as well. Uh, and you just feel very, very tired. You just don't have the energy to, to pass the day. So even if you hold a cup, um, you find that uh, when you're holding a cup, your hand starts to cramp. Because- But you mean this you need- result of, of the surgery? Yeah, so after surgery, a lot of my patients, they, they are after surgery, they want to drink. They hold a cup and suddenly they find that the whole arm freezes. They, ca- they can't well, These move. are the side effects you mean. Yeah, it's a side effect from the surgery because your calcium is down. And, oh, I see. And we preempt that usually by giving uh-huh. calcium supplementation immediately post surgery um, uh-huh. and as well as monitoring that. Um, and uh-huh. then we start uh, patients on thyroid hormone replacement as well. And this is the thing that the worry is some patients need to be on 
thyroid replacement for life, uh, calcium mm -hmm. supplements for life. Um, right. And, and so how, it's not a surgery is what do. and we're done. You know, it's not surgery and no. boom, yeah. done, you know. No. It's a it's a, a lifetime of medication. I my surgery as well, so you know, because of the scar. So, if one's oh. life is dependent uh -huh. on appearance, and and you've got a big big line that goes across right here, mm -hmm. you know, it, even in the best of hands, you can still see a line that goes across. Uh, mm -hmm. There are new ways now to to actually operate in the thyroid. They can go uh, transorally, which is here underneath mm -hmm. the gums, or they can go through the armpits. As well right. to to minimize the, the lack of uh, to so that there's no scar there. Okay. Well, uh, well, now it sounds scary because <laughs> at first I thought it was just a routine <laughs> surgery and a lot of people do it, so we can just go for it. Uh, but now it sounds scary. So always consult your doctor before you go for it. Now I know it's why why it's you know so far down the line. So any doctor yeah. that you any endocrinologist that you go to here in Malaysia would suggest medication first. Is that what you think? Or do you yes. think they're uh, like, okay, they go for radio. I Unless um, uh -huh. you would have met, um, and it's very rare to meet um, an American trained uh, endocrinologist in Malaysia as well. And, and, and because the places that actually do radioactive iodine treatment is very few, far in between, uh -huh. um, because you need to be accredited in nuclear medicine as well. So a lot That's of the time true. it's our oncology colleagues who give it. And then people get a bit like, oh, flustered, or why do I have to see an oncologist? Why do mm -hmm. I need to go to the oncology center to get it? It's because they're the only ones who can actually give uh, the radioactive iodine treatment. Right. So if, if, if surgery is so scary, then yeah. what, why do you think, they, well, I know why people are so worried about uh, radio iodine because of radioactivity. What is it about radio iodine therapy that you think is scary? I mean, after a couple of... For two weeks, the radioactivity goes from you, right? You just, it's like quarantine. It's like COVID quarantine. You got to quarantine yourself. And then after that, you're, just, you're not radioactive analogy. anymore, right? That's right. How does so, it work? so actually, you, you have to stay, if you've got young kids, it's not suitable. Because if you got your babies who like to cling around your neck, you can't see them for about 10 to 14 days. If you've got a partner, we tell them, don't sleep in the same bed, let them in the same bedroom. So you, you've got to really, yeah. you know, isolate yourself for about 10 to 14 days. Because really well, if that's the only concern, yeah, if that's the only concern, it's not that big of a deal because we've been on MCO the whole 2020. So <laughs> radio iodine therapy is really not that bad anymore, comparatively, right? If yeah, the only issue is, um, yeah, if the only issue is not getting anybody else radioactive, but you will be fine after the radio iodine therapy, then why not? Would you say so? That, that's actually a good point, Serena. Really nice. So yeah, mm. anybody who is willing to take that step ahead, and I think um, the majority of patients who feel that they want to fire and forget treatment, it's just a, a single dose, mm. just pop. This tablet comes along in a little box that's lined by lead. Uh, it's quite a heavy box. Yeah. Somebody comes in dressed right. up in like a, you know, like a space suit, you could say, a little mm -hmm. cover, and they open it up and you, you take the tablet. Once you take it, uh -huh. you cannot go home on public transport. It's a bit like MCO as well. Uh -huh. You have to stay away yeah. from people. You have to go home in your own transport. Um, right. Ideally not with your partner. So you drive right. yourself. You, know, you can't go mm -hmm. in the grab. <laughs> Get the radio right. ID. Go home, isolate for 10 to 14 days. Yeah. And, and then you're free. Yeah. But, but, this, but in uh, terms of your yeah. body, how do you feel uh, after you've taken yeah. it? So I, actually... A lot of the patients don't feel anything mm -hmm. until about eight to twelve weeks, and that's when okay. they really their, their thyroid function just drops off a cliff. So um, the thyroid function stays kind of stable, highish a little bit for about four to eight weeks, then it just comes down. When it comes mm -hmm. down, that's when you feel really lethargic, really fatigued, um, right. feeling cold, you know, like skin's dry. You just can't stand any. You know, you, you feel like you're in Moscow or somewhere like that all the time. So basically, so, it's a, the, the symptoms of hypothyroidism. So you've gone back to hypo, yeah. basically. <laughs> and that's when yeah. I go, so the, the, the patient goes back to you to get the thyroxine. Yeah. Ah. Indeed, indeed. Okay, well, in comparison, radio iodine ther therapy really isn't that bad. We are so used to MCO that, you know, we can just go for it. Uh, but of course, go for yeah. your medication for it. But uh, in the long term, like you said, surgery has side effects. Does radio iodine therapy? 
Okay, so the Americans, uh, because they have the most experience, they published last year their, their experience in treating patients with radioactive IED. Now, they've been doing this for moons, really mm -hmm. from the late 50s. The problem was that the, the data showed a lot of different doses of the radioactive IED. Some were very, very high doses, some were quite low. Right. Um, in terms of medical speak, we call it 550 millibecquerels, which is quite a standard dose. Mm -hmm. When they looked at the data, they found that there was a slightly higher increased risk of cancer. Oh. But when they looked at the data in greater detail, that mm -hmm. was from the patients who were treated in the late uh, 70s and late 60s, because these were patients who were getting the bigger doses. Right. right? So, so the bigger doses, which we don't use anymore, Mm -hmm. uh, could lead to potentially a uh, mm -hmm. high risk of certain types. Of, but the problem was that you cannot say it was a causative relationship. It was an mm -hmm. associative relationship because there was no randomized control trial to show right. at that time the prospective data. This is all retrospective, looking at mm -hmm. the relationship. Um, I would say, I, I cannot put my hand on my heart and say, yes, radioactive ID leads to cancer. No, you can't no. say that. But right. But you could say there is an association with a higher mm -hmm. dose, but again, you really need uh, proper randomized, um, you know, like a placebo control trial, but not many people will allow themselves to go through that. Of course. Trial to be okay. Well, I mean, that's understandable. No one can predict the future. Uh, but right now, comparatively, it sounds like iodine is a little safer. But uh, in the case, if you have thyroid eye disease like myself, can you explain why? We are not allowed to go for radio iodine. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. Thank you so much for bringing that point. So uh, the thing, Serena, is radioactive iodine, unfortunately, uh, has a well-known uh, severe side effect on thyroid eye disease. So it, essentially, it just makes the inflammation of the muscles, the back of the eyes, and the fat as well, more prominent. Um, mm -hmm. So there are some units, and the Americans started using this. They give patients uh, high dose steroids. Mm -hmm. before giving radioactive iodine and and you try to give that so that that reduces the inflammation so steroids it's an anti-inflammatory so it reduces the inflammation at the back of the eyes mm -hmm. um, however um, in the majority of cases i would say about 80 percent of cases um, that we have seen patients with thyroid eye disease mm -hmm. they get worsening of it so we actually recommend patients that anybody with thyroid eye disease do not go for radio radio iodine and even then, right. if you really have to, then you need very, very high dose steroids for at least like a month beforehand and mm -hmm. then get ready IED and then mm -hmm. continue the steroids as well. Um, oh my God. Yeah, so it's, it's like a, a double whammy. And, and yep. uh, I have not used radio ID for many years, in fact, uh, mm -hmm. because of that risk. Um, but uh, I, I know... Um, Many of my colleagues here and, and, and elsewhere would still use it, especially in, in the US, because they, they think it's a very simple, once-off, mm -hmm. fire and forget treatment. Um, we have had cases where the first time they get rid of it, it still doesn't work, especially the second dose, because okay. they just small in the beginning. You know? Right. So, yeah, okay, so. well, I mean, that's for thyroid eye disease uh, patients. Hopefully you're not one. <laughs> but I mean, at least now we know what our options are. Well, now, now that we've... Op uh, explore all the things that happens with a thyroid patient. Let's talk about side effects of everything because obviously if I'm on um, medication for life, I'd like to know what it does to me. The side effects of carbamazole. This is not for life, but this is for the, you know, uh, balance period, the, the, what do you call it? Adjustment period. Carbamazole. You know, I still have some in my, in my cupboard, by the way. I've been given so much, but yeah, sometimes I lose count, but I'm pretty sure I take it every day. Uh, okay. But sometimes also I, it occurs to me like, oh, I'm taking a lot of these. Are there any known side effects of uh, carbamazole? Yes. Uh, so so you know, carbamazole is, because it's an anti-thyroid drug um, mm -hmm. and it's been designed for uh, many years. In fact, the predecessor called propathyrosol and there's mm -hmm. also one... Prior to that, in the states called to accumulate um, preferentially in the bone marrow. I see. And, and um, in about three one thousand cases, 
Um, mm -hmm. And that's in the literature, so 0.003% of patients. It can cause your white blood cell to plummet. I so, see. But then it doesn't drop to like zero. You know, your white cells will go down to about two. It's, it's the same kind of white cells that people who undergo chemotherapy would get. Mm -hmm. so, so you still have some white cells, but mm -hmm. it's just down a little bit. So part of the white cell count um, is because white cells are made up of things called neutrophils, lymphocytes, mm -hmm. basophils, mm -hmm. eosinophils, monocytes. The one that goes down is your neutrophils. So your neutrophil mm -hmm. count will be low. It will be less than two usually. And then your white cell count will be something like two as well. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what we call, a long name for it, it's called agranulocytosis. So mm -hmm. how would you know if that happens? I mean, if a patient gets it, our warning is, if you get three things all together, and that's mm -hmm. fever, sore throat, rash all over, like a lobster. So if you, you get a rash, uh, fever up to 38, and a sore mm -hmm. throat, sounds a bit like COVID, but it's not, because COVID you don't get this, this mega rash. That's mm -hmm. the uh, agranocytosis setting in. And what you need to do is stop the drug immediately, mm -hmm. call us, come to a &E or call us, and we say, okay, we'll stop the carbamazole, and the effect of carbamazole will be out of the system and within about 48 to 72 hours. Mm -hmm. And then we observe. Now, that's the major number one side effect. Number two side effect is that sometimes carbamazole can also affect the liver. Right. So, ah, yeah, so the liver can get inflamed. Like bunk up, right. Like, really, really inflamed. Then what happens is that your eyes turn a bit yellow, your stools turn a bit pale, your urine turns dark. You know, like the darkness and such, you know, so like Darth Vader kind of darkness. So it's all that's kind of like what we call cholestatic jaundice or, or liver impairment with uh, carbamazole. Now, in saying that, in the last two years, I've only seen one case, so it's super rare. With the agran cytosis, I have not seen one in Malaysia yet. Thank God. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so that's for carbamazole. It's good. Good to know. We know the side effects now. Um, and I didn't get any fever or rash that I remember about. I'm trying to remember if you warned me about it, though. Um, <laughs> that's that's Cabemazole. But how about thyroxine that people will have to go with for life if they do go for the surgery and a radio iodine option? Yeah. Uh, okay. Thyroxine, um, you're kind of lucky because uh, with thyroxine, it's a replacement hormone. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as a hormone, it's probably the cleanest drug that's about because it mimics what your body makes. Okay, so, some good news. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The only danger is if you get too much, uh, mm -hmm. you get the same symptoms that you started off with. You overactive fat. So your, your heart starts fluttering, you start sweating, you start having a tremor. Uh, okay, then you, you, you might just get back to the thyroid issues, uh, symptoms from, with thyroid issues. Okay, that's good to know. So we've gone through the medication and also, also the options as well. Thank you for the big picture. Now, alternatives you know there are people talking about things like biohacking functional medicine where does this sit when it comes to thyroid patients do you believe in it does it work hand in hand with medical practitioners or do you think it's no okay okay that, that's a great one Trina. actually there because there is no peer-reviewed evidence-based data for mm -hmm. any of these other therapies it's very difficult for us uh, to say that it is it is okay because uh, in medicine everything has to be evidence based, uh, right. and remember evidence based is you have at least four years worth of data behind a particular medication or behind a particular therapy uh, with the efficacy data, the safety data, and all of that. And if you don't have that, it's really difficult to say that it kind of works. Well, although functional medicine is very big right now in the Western sphere, so there's a lot of uh, you know articles about it right uh, arguments about how it can help where do you stand I, I, is it a personal thing when it comes to this or are you strongly against it i, I think it's the stand that the british thyroid association uh, has and the mm -hmm. american thyroidology association has it's all um could, because for us we have to follow the guidelines and, and yes what in a sense we have to follow the hippocratic oath which is you know uh, first do no harm and and you really have to make sure that the drugs that we use have good efficacy data and has mm -hmm. the least risk um, uh, in terms of harm per se. And mm -hmm. when it comes to functional therapy, we, we don't have a leg to stand on as, as medical practitioners to say that this is safe to use because we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, 
what you're really relying upon is I call it n equals one data. So just one person who says, okay, I have had good results with this or another mm -hmm. one person who says these are the good things I've got from it. And, and that's, that's not powered enough as one is in, in scientific speak. Okay, so I, I've had friends, uh, other, other thyroid patients who did go that route, but together with, you know, the medical practitioner. So if your patient insists on doing it, you know, the functional medicine way, how would you support that? Okay, we would say absolutely uh, that the choice is um, one's own. Um, <laughs> the patient is free to make one's choice. and, and uh, But as a medical practitioner, it would be inherently difficult to mm. say that yes we we think it works because we don't mm. know we haven't studied it we haven't looked at the data um it's a bit like acting as a detective or one would say as a not as a lawyer or as a judge yeah. but just to see where's the evidence Correct. behind it if there's no evidence behind it it's very okay difficult. well i know where you stand <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you're aware that you know your patients have all these other external um yeah. influence Right? Do you have a lot of patients coming in that saying like, oh, but you know, this person says I should do this and this and this and this? We have a few, yeah. Uh, not to breach uh, patient confidentiality, but it, it's actually quite a common uh, theme because mm -hmm. it, I think in our society as such, we, 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 we've kind of been brought up to, to rely on alternative, uh, I wouldn't say alternative medicine, but other therapies uh, just, yeah. you know, besides Western medicine, per se, um, the only caveat of Western medicine is that we're, we're really rigidly um, held by the, the, the data that has to support it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what we're kind of, yeah. you know. So if you're going to worry about, <laughs> yeah, so if you're going any other way, you know, don't be too hard on your medical pr practitioner. Because when I started with Dr. Saifu as well, I was at the same time, I think, seeing a Chinese medicine, remember? And I yeah. was taking all sorts of funny medicine. I had to swallow 48 pills in a day. And thank God you told me to stop it because uh, it was painful to swallow and I didn't know what I was swallowing. So at least know what you're doing if, if you're seeing alternative, you know, treatment. Well, that's the end of my questions. Did I leave out anything, doctor? Would you like to add anything about our thyroid talk? As well? I'm to, I'm I guess the, the, the thing that I, I want to bring up is because, you know, uh, regards thyroid in pregnancy, uh, maybe I, I, mm -hmm. I forgot uh, to say, um, because from, from my perspective, um, it, it's kind of important to bear in mind that if you've got Graves' disease um, mm -hmm. or overactive thyroid and, and you're pregnant, um, even before you, you, you become pregnant, you, the idea is if it's untreated or inadequately treated overactive thyroid, it is almost impossible mm -hmm. um, to get pregnant. Um, right. Because an overactive thyroid uh, renders one to be, I wouldn't say, you know, at a high risk of um, infertility, but, but the evidence is there. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and if let's say one does get pregnant um, and the thyroid is still overactive, the mother's health is at risk because um, your thyroid is overactive, your heart's doing all that, right? So there's a high risk of congestive heart failure. And, and right. there's a high risk of a thing called preeclampsia where the blood pressure goes up, or what we call a thyroid storm. Um, mm -hmm. Having an overactive thyroid that is stable during pregnancy is the best thing because as the pregnancy progresses, the thyroid also remains stable through the time. Um, uh, but, but the ones to run into difficulty or danger or let's say risk of uh, miscarriage or placental abruption or preterm delivery is when the thyroid is not under control. Yeah. Um, so I, my message is if, if anyone's considering pregnancy uh, as a young lady, um, mm -hmm. and you are overactive, please ensure it's stabilized first. Yes, case in point. I was lucky I was stabilized before I actually got pregnant. And uh, when I got pregnant, a doctor immediately reduced my dosage to a very, very safe form, but he made sure that my hypothyroidism wouldn't come back. Um, so I was okay to proceed with the pregnancy. As, as, as you can see now, I'm on, on zero medication. 
And so the projection after this, because I'm month five now, is I should okay. be fatal, right? After yes. delivery, what is the percentage of people who go back up, for example? In, in pregnancy, uh, the risk of you becoming hyperthyroid now, one, once you're on your second and third trimester, is almost zero. You, you're, you're plain sailing now, so, which is kind of okay. good. However, mm -hmm. big however, once you deliver, mm -hmm. uh, in post, post delivery, um, the body kind of like undergoes a lot of physiological changes, and there's usually a higher uh, risk of overactive thyroid coming back because you're making more antibodies that attack the thyroid yes. Um, yes. but but that's where we, we we keep an eye on things um and and if the if mom needs mm -hmm. antithyroid drugs the good thing is if you are lactating or breastfeeding it is okay to use antithyroid drugs you know? okay so, i i'm in the safe zone <laughs> but so, uh okay yeah, thank you. Sorry, sorry to, to interrupt, but uh, I mean, me aside, I think we've covered everything that we need to when it comes to talking about thyroid as a whole. So I thank you, doctor, for so much of your time because he just literally came out of emergency. I feel terrible now. And uh, don't be surprised if I bug you again. But for now, thank you so much, Dr. Saifok. Thank you.